It's cracking YouTube. Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football YouTube channel. As always, it's your boy Nick. Hope you've enjoyed the last couple vitters, top three bold predictions, and the PPR mock draft zero running back strategy. It's time to get back into the team outlooks because there's still a lot of them to go and there's not that much time left in the preseason. So I'm gonna have to bang these bad boys out. And if you could see, it's time, baby. It's time to get to my dirty birds. It's time to start with the NFC South. 28 to three, okay, get that shit out of the way. Be mature, we grow up, thank you. At least my team was in the damn Super Bowl, all right? A lot of y'all were probably kicked out by January, by December. All y'all cared about was fantasy football halfway through the season. I know y'all are a lot of Browns fans. We got some Ravens fans, some Lions fans out there. I don't wanna hear that 28 to three bullshit. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, baby. Let's talk some fantasy football. As I always like to thank my sponsor, Monster! Y'all are the shit, you keep me stocked, you keep me fueled, you keep me energized so I can do my research and bang out these videos. So I appreciate you. Even though you ain't really my sponsor, but it'd be cool as hell if you was. Let's talk some football. So we bike. If you need a good summer playlist, Spotify users, check out my Darty Marg season. Playlist on Spotify, just search my name in the search bar on Spotify, Nick Ercolano. You can figure it out by my YouTube channel name and the playlist will pop up if you need a good one for like day drinks or whatever y'all young folks do nowadays. But let's talk football. Matt Ryan obviously uh, exploded last year, right? MVP type season. He set career highs in passing yards with over 4,900. Passing touchdowns, 38. Completion percentage, just under 70%. Yards per attempt, 9.3. Just a, an incredible year by every statistical measure. That being said, all those numbers were way above career highs or career averages, and he's been in the league for a long time. so. There's a good chance that there's regression there, but there's also a chance that he peats or stays just below those numbers. I mean, look at the offense that he has right now. He had, th this is an incredible offense. They have Julio Jones, they re-signed Taylor Gabriel, Mohamed Sanu, has Loki, I'll hit you with some stats later in the video, been a very, very, very reliable wide receiver too. Not flashy, doesn't pop on the stat sheet, but he's been awesome for Matt Ryan. Of course, they have the two dynamite running backs who are great pass catchers, and they have an up-and-coming tight end who's going to be a very, very good pass catcher in the next couple of years. So say what you want about his numbers last year being way above the norm, but he's got a lot working for him, and I think he can definitely repeat those numbers again in 2017. So the biggest question mark heading into 2017 isn't even a player, right? It's it's the fact that they have Kyle Shanahan as the offensive coordinator who absolutely turned this offense into a juggernaut. They are just like a well-oiled machine, scoring machine, fluid as ever. Just incredible. Moves over to San Fran to be the head coach there. Now they're replacing him with Steve Sarkeesian. Dan Quinn's come out basically and said that Sarkeesian's gonna keep the offense very much the same, just with a few tweaks, obviously, because he's gonna have to sprinkle in his own ideas, schemes, and things like that. But they're gonna keep it very similar to how Shanahan ran things there, which is very good news for any Falcons fans and uh, fantasy owners of Falcons players. So I'm not super worried about the coaching change, but it's definitely something to take into consideration. Currently, he's going off the board overall pick 87 as QB7. He's actually behind Jameis Winston, which is wild to me. So in a year where a lot of these quarterbacks are kind of getting grouped in the same range, I'm gonna let quarterbacks fall to me, whatever of like that six to 11 range, whichever one of those guys falls to me, I'll be perfectly fine taking 40 picks after the other. But I do like Matt Ryan. I wouldn't take James Winston over him. I would take Ryan over Cam Newton. I would take Ryan over a lot of those guys. You can check out my rankings for that if you wanna see who I would take him over. But pick 87, definitely very good value for Ryan there. As I talked about, we have a lot of weapons on this team, starting with Julio Jones. Just a fantasy god, an absolute savage. I like to call him Sticks because the jersey is just flawless. There's not like a smoother jersey in the NFL than this right here. Just like there's not a smoother player in the NFL than him. I mean, Antonio Brown's pretty goddamn smooth. So is Odell. So is, uh, there's a lot of players probably smoother, but he's a animal, the all-time leading receiver in receiving yards per game, Julio Jones. He won't be my first wide receiver off the board in fantasy because Antonio Brown has that slot, but anytime after that, I think it's perfectly okay. okay taking him there. I think, I believe I have him ranked as wide receiver too. So according to PFF, Pro Football Focus, over past four seasons, Jones has ranked first, fifth, first, and first in yards per route run 
just like a very strong metric when you're looking at fantasy receivers and how, how much success they have and how much success they'll have going forward. So first three of the four years. You know, the elephant in the room with Julio is always like the injury bug. Every time you look on the damn TV, it's like him limping around. Oh, Julio's hurt his ankle or he hurt his foot or he hurt his ankle. But he's actually only missed. He's not played in three games in as many years. So for the last three seasons, he's only missed three games. I didn't look at the numbers, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that of the other elite wide receivers that you would take around the same draft position or in the first or second round, I'm sure a handful of them have missed at least that many games, if not more. So what you say is an injury risk? Uh, it's very debatable. I actually think picking Julio is, it's, it's almost like a personal decision. It's like, do you want to deal with the bullshit that goes along with having Julio? Do you want a questionable or a probable, I forget how, how it even works in the NFL anymore. Do you want that little mark next to his name on your fantasy roster every single week? Because it seems like it's always there and you need to be monitoring that. So if that's something that annoys you, if that's something you don't want to deal with, Odell Beckham, AJ Green, basically the same value around the same draft pick. That's something you could do. I'll personally take him as, as wide receiver two overall. He did undergo a very, very small uh, foot surgery. So this is the third foot surgery on the same foot, but it, it was just to, <laughs> to remove a bunion or something like that. I don't know. Not supposed to affect him in any way. Should be 100% healthy for training camp. Should be ready to roll. As always, that's how he enters the year. My, my thing is this. Last year was the fourth consecutive season for Julio where he's had a subpar touchdown total, right? He scored six times last year. And it's making me think like, you know, Julio is such a dominant player, right? We've seen him go over, was it 17 or 1800 yards last year? And every year you're like, oh, Julio needs to put it all together and have that one year where he scores 12, 15 touchdowns, right? We don't know if it's ever gonna come. They just don't utilize him in the red zone. Like why why use him when you have Vonta Freeman, when you have Tevin Coleman, and you have these running options that work so well and the offensive line moves defensive linemen so well, like stick to the ground game, stick to what you know. Julio only had six targets inside the 10 yard line last year. Let me give you three names that had more targets inside the 10 yard line than Julio Jones did last year. Seth Roberts, Jermaine Curse, Traveris Cadet. Come on. What I do like about Steve Sarkeesian coming in is he came out on record and said that he needs to get Julio more involved in the red zone or near the end zone. Quoted, when you have a player like Julio, it's making sure we maximize his opportunities. Let's make sure he's one of the primary receivers on that play because it's such a touch a tough matchup for anybody one-on-one. -on -one. While uh, the touchdown totals weren't there, Sarkeesian is looking to get him more involved near the end zone, right? Also worth noting, Jones scored three touchdowns in the Falcons' three playoffs games at the end of 2016. He did show out at the end of last year, and it's good going into next year because they'll put that into motion again. Enough about Julio, though. Next up, we have uh, Mohamed Sanu. Last offseason, signed that five-year, $32 million deal. Very questionable. Still kind of questionable considering the... Uh... Sorry, I just got like a, such a random comment on YouTube. Y'all, some of y'all say the weirdest shit. Much better real life player than fantasy player. Finished last year with 59 catches, 653 yards, four touchdowns. He was wide receiver, wide receiver 57 in fantasy. So what I would say is I'm not targeting Julio in any of my fantasy, I mean, uh, Sanu as in any of my fantasy drafts. Currently going as pick 176. So in 10 team leagues, he's basically free. In 12 team leagues, he's in the last round or two of your drafts. So you can get him for free. What intrigues me again is, you know, Julio always has that kind of injury red flag. And if, you know, if he goes down, Sanu basically automatically takes over that number one receiver role and is going to see 10 to 12 targets a game. Easy plug and play, plug and forget about wide receiver two for the rest of the season if something were to happen to Julio. So he's basically a handcuff. He's one of the few handcuffs at wide receiver in the NFL. So as per PFF, again, Pro Football Focus, no receiver has had better hands than Sanu over the past two seasons dropping just three passes on 109 catchable targets. The man with the most popular name in the world, read a goddamn book, better real life player than fantasy player. Then comes in uh, Taylor Gabriel. Crazy, crazy year last year, similar to Tyreek Hill. Big time playmaker, scored a lot of touchdowns on minimal opportunities. They re-signed him this off season. Similar story to a lot of NFL players cut by the Cleveland Browns, found success elsewhere. Gabriel's tiny. He's like 5'8", 170 pounds, soaking wet. He is just a playmaker in every sense of the word. He's a good deep threat opposite of Julio. He turned 39 touches, 39 into seven touchdowns last year. He led the entire NFL in fantasy points per 
snap. And he averaged 16.3 yards per reception. He's a boomer bust player in every sense of the word. You know, he came on strong towards the second half of the year, obviously. He played in just 41% of the, of the snaps for the Falcons over the full year. And what's kind of concerning is even when he was putting up big numbers and, and producing a lot from weeks 8 to 16, he only played in 50% of the snaps. So they didn't look at him as a full-time player. You also have to realize that when you're a player like that, you get touches manufactured for you. So Shanahan was manufacturing touches to Gabriel. And now that he's gone, it might not work out that way again. He's currently going off the board wide receiver 69, 179th overall. So, you know, he's 26 years old. He's a small school product, Abilene Christian. Very, very unlikely that he repeats any of those kind of efficiency numbers that he did last year, but you don't really have to pay for him. So you can get him for free. He could be a late round flyer. Definitely a, be uh, a best ball type of draft pick. Wouldn't probably touch him in redraft leagues though. And then after those three guys, you have Justin Hardy and uh, they signed Andre Roberts this off season. Uh, you know, they'll fight each other out for wide receiver four scraps. I'm not touching either of them in fantasy. The next weapon I want to touch on here is Austin Hooper. You can find him on my tight end top three sleepers list, which I'll link up here or here. I always forget which way YouTube links the, the videos that I link in there. Austin Hooper, I love this kid. 22 years old, was thrust into the spotlight during his rookie season, and he did really well in my opinion. A few injuries limited him to, to just 11 games, but he's getting picked right now as tight end 16, so 144th overall. Ton of value there, I think. A ton of upside for someone you don't have to spend anything on. But like I said, he's 22. He's just 15 days older than the Bucks' first round pick this year, OJ Howard. He's two months younger than Evan Ingram, the Giants' first round pick at tight end. So he's younger, he's just the same age or younger than these guys, and he has a full season of experience that went deep into the Super Bowl. The Falcons didn't re-sign Jacob Tammy, so that leaves 11 red zone targets open for grabs, right, in this offense. Hooper proved he could be a great receiver and a, and a great playmaker. Last year, he ranked fourth in the NFL among tight ends in fantasy points per target. He had the third highest yards per reception among tight ends with at least 19 receptions. 14.3 was his yards per reception. And among tight ends in the NFL, he was tied for second with 40 plus res yard receptions. So, he, he can make big plays, great hands. He was rated a, as one of the top blockers for PFF last year, run blocking, pass blocking. So he has the skill set to be a three down player and he can do it all. He's only going to get better as he gets older, right? It's just 22 years old. 6'5", 255 pounds, Hooper has great size, great ability all around. And I think there's just so much upside here in this pick. And if nothing else, he has that's his floor. Tight end 16 has to be his floor. In this offense, the highest scoring offense in the NFL, there's no way he doesn't see 65 70 targets to the position with Jacob Tammy gone. And if you're in a keeper league or a dynasty league, he has a ton of value because this is the thing with tight ends. They usually develop slowly, right? Rookie year is always like an, uh, is a terrible statistical year. Almost every rookie tight end has a bad statistical year. The second year is where they make that kind of jump to, you know, maybe 550 receiving yards, five to six touchdowns, 50 catches. And then that summer is when all the breakout articles come out like, oh, this is why this guy is going to develop and this is why he's going to be a breakout candidate. We see it with Eric Ebron every summer. We see it with a lot of players, right? And I think this is, I think Hooper takes that step before the third year. I think this is the year that he just jumps into the spotlight and finishes as a top 10 tight end. But that's enough for the passing weapons. Well, I guess these two are passing weapons also. We'll get to the running backs. Of course, we have Devonta Freeman and Tevin Coleman. Probably the best duo of running backs we've seen in a backfield in a long time. They have one of the best run blocking lines in the NFL. It was top 10 by Pro Football Focus as well as Football Outsiders. Devonta Freeman's a no-brainer first rounder for me this year. Standard PPR, doesn't matter the format. He was a top six back in fantasy last year. Number one overall. The year prior to that, back-to-back -back years of 1,500 total yards, 13 touchdowns. I think people are going to undervalue him again this year because they're like, oh, Tevin Coleman's in the backfield with him too. Aren't you nervous about the splits? No, I'm not nervous about the splits. Devon uh, listen to these stats, first of all. Devonta Freeman, there was only one game last year where Devonta Freeman didn't have more than 15 touches, and it was a blowout game against the Rams where they didn't need to use him. 15 touches every game, super efficient mind, a great run blocking line. You don't need 30 touches in order to produce those numbers. What else is interesting? In games where Devonta Freeman and Tevin Coleman both played together, Freeman averaged more fantasy points in games where they played together than in games that he played by himself. That's crazy. Again, Freeman, I'm perfectly fine taking Freeman in the top 10, 8, 9, 10 overall. I'm okay with that. Then you look at Tevin Coleman, right? He was a beast on his own. A top 20 running back in both standard and PPR. But I'm here to say buyer beware on Coleman. I'm calling it right now overvalued. If you're going to spend a fifth or sixth round pick on Coleman, don't. Here's why. His efficiency numbers were out of control and not repeatable. Coleman caught 31 passes last year. 
averaged 13.6 yards per reception. Just listening to a fantasy footballers podcast the other day, that 13.6 yards per reception was the highest among any running back over the last 36 years. It's not repeatable. He had Kyle Shanahan there who absolutely loved Coleman. He was the reason he's even on the Falcons and he used the shit out of him. Without Shanahan and these efficiency numbers, it's gonna dip. And then the next number you gotta look at is his 11 touchdowns. I'm gonna put a chart up on the screen right now, but basically breaks down Devonta Freeman versus Tevin Coleman and their touches like near the end zone, right? The red zone targets, red zone rushing, inside the 10, inside the five. What you see here is Tevin Coleman had four targets inside the five, inside the 10 yard line, and he had three rushes inside the five yard line. Not a lot of opportunity in, in the scoring zone, right? So for him to put up 11 touchdowns and only have seven scoring like opportunities in that area is ridiculously efficient again, right? So both of those numbers have to come back down to earth. Whenever you're historically great, there's a good chance the next year they come back down to the trend line, the, the norm. Next year, in order for him to repeat that top 20 pick or that top 20 ranking where he's getting picked right now, he's currently going uh, 58th overall is running back 20. He's going to need a big increase in volume in order to make up for the efficiency loss here. Out of all running backs, he had the league's 47th most touches, but finished as 14th in fantasy points per game in PPR. So you can just see how good he was with how limited of touches he had. And it's just, it's unreasonable to think that he can repeat those numbers. So if he wasn't being drafted inside the top 20 this year, I would say, you know, Coleman has a nice floor because he's still going to get touches. But that being said, you know, from a real football standpoint, you just look at it like the Falcons as a team, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So why why would they scale back on Freeman? It's not like he, Freeman was overused in any sense. Why would they scale back on Freeman and scale up on Coleman, right? It, it wouldn't make sense. So I think they keep the split almost just even as it was last season. If he doesn't put up historical numbers again, Coleman is going to drop from that top 20 ranking. And he's getting picked at 20. So I think he's more of a high-end RB3 in my eyes than the RB2 that he's getting picked at. So that'll wrap up this Team Outlook video. I hope you enjoyed again. If you did, please just scroll down a little bit. Give it that thumbs up button. Uh, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe as well. Next video, I think, will be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers outlook. Should be an interesting one. A lot of new additions to the offense. So go follow me on Twitter. Go subscribe to the blog if you are not already. And I'll see you all next time. Peace out, big ghost. And thank you for uh, spending your time with me today. Kill these niggas, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs>